morning, and welcome to Linux Fest Northwest. It's nice to be back here in the Pacific Northwest, and I'm Seth from EFF over in San Francisco. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I am going to talk today about income possibilities. So I have some income possibilities for you. You can. Um... Okay, that's not actually the kind of income possibilities that I'm talking about. Uh, so income possibilities as a single word is kind of a cute and kind of obscure word that means things that can't both exist at the same time or a set of things that can't exist at the same time. Um, it seems like this is a kind of old word in philosophy. And Ambrose Bierce, who used it in the Devil's Dictionary, suggested that if you want to threaten someone in a really high class way, you can say, sir, we are income possible. <laughs> Um, so that's a high class kind of threat. Of course, there are, there's other vocabulary for things that can't exist at the same time. And another term that we use a lot is trade-offs. As they say, you can't always get what you want. So there's a joke at MIT, for example, that when you go to MIT, you have to pick two of work friends and sleep. Or engineers often like to say that you can have things done good, fast, and cheap, but not all three, only two. And you can pick which two. And so there are lots of these situations in which we have to give up for some reason, something that we want, something that we prefer, something that we value. And we may have some flexibility or some choice about what it is that we give up, some choice about which side of a trade-off we take. So we might like to think that this isn't going to be the case in software as it often is in the physical world. So if civil engineers are building a bridge, there might be certain engineering trade-offs having to do with the limitations of uh, matter, having to do with the limitations of metal. And we might think, well, software is made from scratch out of pure logic. And so these limitations shouldn't really apply in the same way that the physical world does. Um, and we're sort of starting from zero. We choose the structure of the program. We choose the logic of the program. So why should we have to have trade-offs at all? But when researchers look into this and when programmers write programs, we often find that these trade-offs do exist. And often there can be mathematical proofs, formal logical proofs, that certain properties can't exist at the same time. And so you can have mathematical proofs that show that there is no object that has a certain combination of properties, which could be an algorithm. There is no such algorithm. Uh, it could be a process or software system. There is no such software system. Sometimes we also have long experience that suggests that certain trade-offs exist, even though we don't have a proof that those trade-offs have to exist. Um, a famous computer science example, which you may have encountered if you've taken a distributed systems course or a database course, has to do with databases. If you have a distributed database, there's a proof. Um, Brewer and Gilbert and Lynch say the system can't provide all three of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. And they give technical definitions of what each of those mean. They're all things that you might like your database to have. Um, you want the different parts of the database to agree with each other about what's in the database. You want the database to continue to be available, even if there's an outage between things. Um, you want it to not shut down. Well, there are formal definitions of each of these, but you can't get all three. And there's a mathematical proof that you can't get all three. Uh, and so that's unfortunate. There's another example that often hits people a little bit harder, which has to do with voting systems. So there are lots of different voting systems out there, uh, ways of deciding, of aggregating the votes, of aggregating people's preferences, and deciding who is the winner or which option is the winner, which option best satisfies the group's preferences. Um, people have been inventing these for a long time. There's not just one way to do it. For example, in the US for most government elections, there's just a total number of votes. Each voter gets one vote, and you add up the number of votes that each option gets. But there are other alternatives like ranked choice voting and approval voting and several other systems where what the voters say about their preferences is different, and the algorithm for combining those to get an overall result is different. So Kenneth Arrow looked at this back in 1951, and he says, well, we want to have certain properties that we might think of as fair for voting systems. We want to say that the voters can get to whatever outcome they want. So if you have a list of outcomes, some combination of votes should be able to reach each outcome. 
There shouldn't be a dictator who's a person who just always wins automatically. Um, there's a controversial one called independence of irrelevant alternatives, which means that if you add a new option that nobody likes better than the existing options, that that shouldn't change the outcome. Um, the voting system that's most used in the US does not have this property because if you add a popular third party candidate, the popular third party candidate can take votes away from um, the main or leading candidates and can actually change the outcome. But nonetheless, there are systems that have this option. Uh, there's, okay, so there are several of these properties, including again, the, the incentive to vote honestly that you shouldn't have to sort of sit around and think like, well, if I vote for this person, even though I don't like this person, it might lead to a better outcome than voting for the person I really like. Okay, so Arrow said, in fact, we can't get all of these properties. There is no voting system that provides all of these properties. Uh, and that might be a bit disappointing if you're thinking, if you're working in this area and you're wanting to improve voting systems, you have to pick at least one of these to give up in your voting system. Now, you can pick which one you want to give up, but you have to give up at least one of them. Uh, there's another really interesting story that people often like to talk about in medical education. So when people finish medical school, they get a medical internship, typically in a hospital, and they work there to practice being a doctor. And they have preferences about where they would like to work, where they would like to have medical residency. So there is software that takes data about where the medical residents would like to work, in which hospitals, and which medical residents are preferred by which hospitals, and tries to find a solution about who works where. Uh, and one goal for such a system is stability. And stability means that there shouldn't be an incentive to go outside the system and say, well, the system assigned me over here, but there's a, a different hospital that I would prefer to work at and that hospital would actually prefer to have me compared to the people the system gave them, so let's just make a side deal. So there shouldn't be an incentive for side deals, for example. And there were, well, there's a very interesting paper about a redesign of the algorithm to consider other considerations like there are often couples who've gone through medical school together who would like to live together during their residencies. And therefore, if they get placed far apart, that would be a problem for them or a hardship for them. Another interesting thing about the change that was made to this system in 1998 is that it used to give higher priority to the hospital's preferences, and it now gives higher priority to the student's preferences. And it's interesting to see that that decision has to be made, that you can't just say, what's the best matching outcome? You can say, well, what's the best matching outcome if we think that hospitals getting interns that they prefer is very important? Or what's the best matching outcome if we think that the interns getting to work where they want is very important? But in fact, researchers found that in some cases, given other constraints like the stability thing, that algorithms that provide one optimization fail to provide the other optimization, meaning that this choice has to be made. Um, and so there's a paper by Roth and Perenson about this, and Roth won the Nobel Prize for some of this work. And basically they say, well, they knew that some of these trade-offs existed, and so they made some simulations and they made a judgment call about what kind of algorithm they thought produced better outcomes within some of these constraints. Another area where this comes up is in formalized ethical theories. So if you try to write down a rule for what makes a situation better, uh, there's a super paradox-filled area of philosophy called population axiology, which has to do with what do we think is better or worse, regardless of the question of what is right or wrong for people to do, just what do we think is a better or worse outcome, uh, all other things being equal. And so there's this attempt at saying, well, this makes the world better or this makes the world worse. For example, you might say, well, if people are happier, all other things being equal, that makes the world better. 
And when you do this and when you try to write some of these principles down and some of your expectations for some of these principles, you can potentially find cycles where your principles seem to say, well, A is better than B, B is better than C, and C is better than A. This might have some practical consequences if you're trying to teach artificial intelligence systems to make choices that have an impact on the world. Uh, Peter Eckersley, who runs our department over at EFF, has a paper coming out about the idea that some of these paradoxes lead to what he calls ethical uncertainty. If you try to formally teach a computer how to make decisions in some ethical framework. And one way of putting this is that if you have one of these cycles, at least two of the principles that led to this cyclic ranking, if you want to remove the paradox, have to basically allow an answer, I'm torn here, instead of A is better than B or B is better than A. Um, and this is an example involving some specific principles from ethical philosophy that have been formalized, and there is a cycle that results. Um, and so if you're interested in this, you can look at Peter's paper. Uh, there's the philosopher called Arrhenius who came up with a lot of these paradoxes, and he's written a large number of papers about some of the paradoxes in formalized ethics and some of the trade-offs that occur. Um, but Peter has the paper coming out about the consequences of this for ethical uncertainty in AI systems. Speaking of AI, there's been a lot of controversy and a lot of discussion about the notion of fairness in AI. And so, of course, researchers then tried to write down, okay, well, if we're going to talk about this, what do we mean by an AI making fair decisions or being fair or unfair? What does that even mean? And the researchers have been able to come up with a number of different definitions about what AI fairness could mean. And one thing that seems rather unfortunate is that there was a proof that some of these different definitions of fairness are in fact incompossible with each other. That if an AI is fair in one particular sense, it is not necessarily fair in another sense. And that these notions of fairness may contradict each other. Which on the one hand may be a very familiar idea from everyday life, but on the other hand may be kind of disappointing if you're hoping that you can just resolve this question in artificial intelligence. And so, um, this is a paper that talks about that fairness issue. Now there's an interesting thing. I have a link here and I'm sorry that it's so small. Google made a visualization about some other research and they took a very positive angle on this question. So in Google's visualization, they say, well, we have a research result that shows that if you have all of these different definitions of fairness, you can pick any one you want and it will be possible to implement that one in software. So they're very happy about that result. Like, all of these decisions individually can actually be computed by software. There is a way to have the software use whichever definition of fairness you want. However, there is another result that says it's going to then potentially violate the other ones. Uh, so you can take the positive angle like, hey, we get to choose and the negative angle, like, hey, we have to choose. <laughs> now, there's a, an interesting example of one that hasn't been formally proven, but that appears to be true from experience, called Zuko's Triangle. Uh, this is named after a really interesting computer scientist called Zuko, who lives in Colorado, and has invented a number of cool crypto technologies. Uh, including the cryptocurrency Zcash and also the Tahoe Laughs um, file system and a bunch of other stuff. And Zuko says, well, we have this triangle where we have three things that we would like for names because names are a famously difficult problem in computer science and we would like them to be maybe decentralized, meaning that there's not an authority who gets to decide who gets to use which name. And we'd like them to be human memorable. So we might like the names to be like Seth, as opposed to like my PGP fingerprint, or a whole bunch of numbers that, you know, like 40 or 50 numbers, which might be hard for a person to remember, which could of course be used as a name, but it might be kind of inconvenient because our memories don't necessarily work that way. 
And then we'd like the names to be secure, which means that we'd like them to be unambiguous. Um, and there are other accounts of what each of these properties means. And we can interestingly find examples of real naming systems or systems that have the effect of naming that have any two of these. So for example, human naming in most societies is decentralized and human memorable. Uh, parents can just pick names without asking anyone or even people can change their own name and you can kind of remember other people's names. I sometimes have a little difficulty with it, but in principle you can remember other people's names. But they're not secure and unambiguous. For example, you can impersonate someone else and there can be two people with the same name and you can get confused between them. Um, and we have other examples where we give up a different one. So for example, PGP for email encryption seems to have decentralized and seems to have secure but not human memorable because the identifiers are these really long numbers that are really hard to remember. Or another example is onion names in Tor where you have something, 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 something dot onion and it's basically this really long random thing that is hard to remember but decentralized and secure. Uh, and there's one other possibility, which one did I not do? Um, oh, not decentralized. Things like the domain name system or certificate authorities. You have someone who's in charge of the namespace and who decides you get to use this name and you don't get to use this name. Um, and if it's not decentralized, you know that can have other concerns like if you don't trust the authority or if you disagree with the authority's decision, there's nothing you can really do about that. Okay, so Zuko thinks that you have to pick two out of these three. There's an interesting side discussion, which I don't really have time for, about whether blockchain technologies uh, are a counterexample to this. And I think that the best answer is probably that the blockchains are not a counterexample to this. <laughs> anyway, if people want to hear about that, we can talk about it at great length. Um, so an example that's come up in my work a bit on privacy, uh, in terms of a rather harsh trade-off, has been we have this problem of traffic analysis. So over at EFF, we've been working a lot on getting HTTPS rolled out for websites so that websites will offer a secure connection. Now the HTTPS technology, um, it protects the content of your communications. It encrypts it so that someone who is tapping or monitoring the network won't be able to see the content of your communications. So then I have a couple of examples here where I just downloaded a couple of different pages from WebMD, which is a medical encyclopedia, and from Wikipedia, and I looked at just the size of the page. And the relevance here is that that information is not something that HTTPS encryption protects. It protects the content, but it doesn't really obscure how much data was sent. And so that means that if someone is watching you use the network, they could potentially see, well, you downloaded a page that was this big as opposed to a page which was that big. So you might be reading about this topic as opposed to another topic. And I find that very concerning because for things like encyclopedias, medical encyclopedias, reference works, that fact of what you're reading can be very sensitive. And people like to say as an analogy in library ethics, the books in the library are public, but the circulation records aren't public. So the information on Wikipedia or WebMD is public, but who reads what is not public, just like the circulation records in a library. So we face really a harsh trade-off here because we could add extra padding data, which is nonsense data or blank data, to the end of every page or every document in order to make them all the same size. And that will disguise which article someone is viewing. But it means that the service will use extra data. And if you have users who pay by the byte, which is very common in the developing world and not that uncommon in the world as a whole, and they may be quite upset or they may reduce their use of the service. On the other hand, you could not add extra padding data. And then it may be fairly clear in some circumstances who is reading what, even with the use of HTTPS encryption. And I have indeed talk to people at the Wikimedia Foundation, which operates Wikipedia, about this. And they basically said this trade-off is very harsh because they have a lot of users in developing countries who pay by the byte, who are really concerned about their use of Wikipedia and don't feel free to just browse around Wikipedia 
at will, and they therefore don't want to deliberately make their articles larger and deliberately make them consume extra data. And it doesn't seem that we can get around this trade-off. Uh, if you have any proposals for how to get around it, I'm happy to talk about them. I've definitely considered a few that didn't work out in practice. So it seems that we probably have to choose one or the other, even though we wouldn't prefer to. Another thing that comes up quite a bit in privacy is anonymity versus latency. Okay, so some systems to try to help people be anonymous online intentionally slowed down your messages because they didn't want to have this correlation like, oh, you sent a message and then you received a message and those happened at the same time. So even though we couldn't directly see how the message got from one person to the other, we can infer that it was probably actually the same message. So some systems would add a delay and they'd say, well, let's just hold on to the message for a while and then we'll deliver it later on. And that creates more ambiguity about who is responsible for the message. And there are some other options. Now we have low latency systems like Tor, which is very popular for online <coughs> anonymity that don't add these delays because they want the system to be as fast as possible for interactive use. And a consequence of that, this is a diagram that a couple of colleagues of mine and I put together a few years ago about how Tor works. Uh, we have this NSA person in the middle here. And this is referring to something that you can see in the original Tor paper from more than a decade ago that they basically say, if someone can see the network at multiple locations, they may be able to realize that activity in one location is correlated with activity in another location. That is, if they can watch the network near a web server and watch the network near a user, there may be a very strong and consistent correlation between data that's sent and received in one place and data that's sent and received in another place, even if they don't literally know how it went all the way through the network. And this has been acknowledged for a long time that Tor doesn't attempt to defend against this case. And so again, that's a rather harsh trade-off. And you can try in a modern system to take the other side of that trade-off. So there's a really cool system called Pond, which is no longer being developed, uh, from Adam Langley, who does incredible work on security and cryptography at Google. Uh, very, very impressive person. In his spare time, he created Pond, which he describes as a non-instant messaging system. <laughs> It's very non-instant. And the idea is that it's a deliberately slow system that tries to obscure who is communicating with whom by being intentionally slow and by requiring you to send only very small messages. And ideally, you send them on a fixed schedule. So you basically connect, for example, every hour. And you always upload a certain amount of data and you always download the same amount of data, regardless of whether you have anything to communicate. And then it's really not clear who is communicating with whom because people's patterns of communication activity are always the same. And of course, the problem is that you then have to send very small messages because any message that you could send has to fit within this fixed size. And you can only send them on this particular schedule. So you have to wait around. Um, and there are some other problems. But I think this is a really clever design. I think it works really well. And I don't think that very many people will want to use it because of the limitations compared to more instant and more flexible messaging tools. Um, we have also dealt with trade-offs in web platform functionality. So we have a thing called Panopticlick that looks at features of your web browser. So when you connect to this site, we have JavaScript that asks your web browser various things about itself. Uh, you could think of it as sort of doing a little interview, like, hey, web browser, uh, where are you from? And uh, when's your birthday? What's your sign? Not literally those things, but it's asking the web browser a bunch of things about itself. And the disturbing consequence of this is that just things that exist in the web platform now that websites can ask browsers about in combination are often unique to a particular computer. Um, a familiar example can be the size of your screen because the website can ask how many pixels is your screen and the web browser will tell it. Well, different people have different size screens. Or it can ask, hey, which fonts do you have installed? 
and different people have different fonts installed. Hey, what operating system are you running on? Hey, what language is it set to? Um, and there are a lot more of these. And so there's a real privacy problem that the website might be able to recognize you even if you have cookies turned off or even if you delete your cookies. So whenever we talk to web browser developers and say, could you maybe not have some of these features? They say, well, web developers really want these features because these features help them make better websites. So they really experience this pressure to have the web platform have more and more functionality. And a consequence of that has been that it's more and more trackable, that client devices are more and more identifiable even without things like cookies. Okay, um, I didn't update this slide, so I gave a version of this talk at LibrePlanet. Um, the details and the person responsible for this have actually become public. So in this slide, I say, well, we have a colleague at a social media company who's made some conjectures, but I don't quote what the conjectures are or who the colleague is. So the colleague is Alex Stamos, who's the chief information security officer of Facebook. And he has made some conjectures. He says people want a lot of things out of social media companies. And they're kind of mad at what the social media companies are doing. And he acknowledges, well, a lot of these criticisms have a lot of validity. And then he says, if you write down a list of the things that people want from their social networks, I don't think they're all compossible. I don't think that a social network can exist that would actually satisfy all of the things that people are asking. Now, that doesn't mean that social media can't be improved or that some of the things can't be provided. But Alex seems to say, well, it may be technically impossible to have a single social network that has all of these properties. And he has a list of things. Um, and they refer to, for example, um, not having censorship and having privacy and not having fake accounts and having automated moderation. Um, he, he, I think he has five or six, and I should have updated this slide to show what they are. And again, this is not a mathematical theorem. It's not proven that social media can never do this. But I think there are indications in this direction um, where, for example, some people have said, well, we want moderation on social networks to be more effective, and we want to see more moderation in order to prevent some kinds of abuse or harassment or conflict. And then some people have said, well, a problem with centralized social media is that they don't really provide free speech, that you can't necessarily say what you want because someone might complain and it might violate a policy or it might get shut down, right? Um, but we probably won't be able to have social networks that provide more total moderation and more total freedom of speech at the same time. And that's just one example. There are other examples too. So I think this is very interesting to think about. That again, it's not saying that criticisms of social media are invalid or inappropriate or that people shouldn't make them or that social media can't be improved. But we might not actually be able to get everything that people want out of a single social media system, even if it's a decentralized system, even if it's based on free and open source software. Okay, so one thing to think about is whether these things matter. And we might hope that typically these things don't happen, that typically there isn't such a limitation or there isn't such a trade-off. But it seems to me that this sort of problem has come up over and over again and sometimes seems to have a practical impact. And I think one way of thinking about that is that problem spaces and people's values are really quite complicated. And so people's values lead to things like ethical dilemmas and things like paradoxes. And these problem spaces lead to things like the privacy versus functionality trade-offs, where you say we want to have a very functional web platform, but we also want to have a very privacy protective web platform. And we want the website to be able to find out a lot about your device, but we also don't want it to be able to find out anything about your device. So the problem spaces and values are complicated. Now, I did discuss this talk with a friend of mine who's an academic researcher. And he said, you know, there are a lot of pressures in academia. And there's a real pressure in academia to publish results. 
and mathematical results have the most prestige. Um, certainly in computer science or in economics, for example. Something that's really mathematical with a lot of equations and formulas and theorems will have a lot of prestige. And so my academic friend said, well, you should also think about the incentives of academic researchers. That a couple of the people I mentioned earlier in this talk have won the Nobel Prize in economics for some of these theorems. Kenneth Arrow won the Nobel Prize. And one of the researchers who worked, actually, I think three different researchers who worked on the matching algorithms for the uh, medical residency, won the Nobel Prize in economics for that work. So researchers really have an incentive to say, I have a mathematical theorem, and I've proven that we can't do this thing. And my friend said, you have to consider that these results aren't always necessarily what people are really thinking about, partly because the definitions of fairness or the definitions of availability or the definitions of privacy or all of these concepts that are used in these theorems don't necessarily match your practical definition or your practical notion. So someone might say, oh, well, no computer system can be fair in this way. And one option is to respond, that's not what I mean by fair. Um, and another possibility, of course, is that the trade-off may be proven to exist. But it may only exist sometimes. Or it may not necessarily be very extreme. So you might be able to give up something in some cases some of the time. And that might satisfy these theorems. So it doesn't necessarily have to be catastrophic. Um, so that's also something to keep in mind. So I think a benefit of being aware of some of these results is that it allows you to clarify better your goals and the possibilities for a particular system. So for example, in distributed systems, in federated systems, you have a lot of choices about who is responsible for a particular functionality. Right? So if we have cryptocurrencies which have gotten a lot of attention, they put a lot of responsibility on the end user that people might not have in traditional financial systems. And that does expose the users to a lot of problems and a lot of difficulties. For example, someone might hack their device and steal all their money, uh, which is pretty bad. And a lot of these other systems have some notion about, well, we're going to put this responsibility over here. So if you have distributed social media, you might say, well, we're not going to have anyone who can perform moderation for the network as a whole. And that means that you have to perform moderation for yourself, or you have to perform moderation for a small group. So these things have been pushed out to the edges. And so you can have a discussion. You can have thinking about, well, where do we want to put each function in the system? And each choice may have some negative consequences. And users may have to take on more responsibility, which they may not always be happy with, in exchange for more autonomy or more control. There is also a possibility to think explicitly and to deliberate explicitly about which side of a trade-off you want to be on. And so a nice example for me is the Debian project. Uh, the Debian project is composed of a bunch of people who are rather nerdy. And when they got started, they knew about the Arrows theorem results about voting systems. And they said, we're going to need to have elections in Debian. Well, which election system should we use? And they had a real discussion and a real deliberation about the advantages and disadvantages of each voting system, which I suspect was actually quite fun for the Debian participants, because they really got to um, geek out on the electoral systems. And they chose one. Did they vote on it? Um, I, actually, <laughs> I actually was wondering about that, because I thought, well, if they voted on it, what voting system did they use? <laughs> and I remember having that problem in middle school that our teacher told us to work together in a group, and then we were supposed to have a decision-making process. And we actually had this discussion like, <laughs> well, what decision-making process are we supposed to use in order to decide on our decision-making process? So I'm not quite sure how Debian dealt with that. <laughs> um, so another benefit of thinking about some of these things is not running in circles, so to speak, trying to solve problems that can't be solved. But of course, as my friend said, it's important to understand whether these limitations really apply to the things that you actually care about. So there might be a definition of security. 
or of fairness or of infeasibility, and that might not actually be your notion of that concept in the situation. And I think, finally, there is a benefit in not assuming that we can make software perfect in certain senses, or that we can get a single tool or a single system that solves every possible problem in an area. And again, people might think, for example, about social media or social networks or something. Well, we want to have the ideal social media system that doesn't have any of the problems that we've encountered with social media. Or in privacy, we want to have the ideal privacy tool that allows people to communicate privacy on, uh, privately online and doesn't have any of the problems that we've encountered with the existing privacy tools. And these may not be possible. Right? There may not be a single tool that can solve all of the problems. And so if we understand some of the trade-offs, then we may not blame software developers for not doing things that are impossible. So that's about it. I think that we have about five minutes. So I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Um, and thanks, and have a great fest. I can also put in a plug and say that there's going to be the EFF uh, forum after this, and I don't remember in what room, but we're going to have their questions about the past year in online freedom and about EFF's work and stuff. So You're people who are in this room, okay. So people who are interested in that are also welcome here if you're interested in more about the substance of what we do. Right. So that, uh, that thing where you have, we're padding, padding the files with a little bit of extra data, uh -huh. wouldn't uh, like, you know, 10 or 20 characters been enough? Um, so the question is about padding, about, and I'm going to repeat it for the recording, yeah. um, whether you could just add a very small amount of data. So and so a difficulty there is that if you pad by a small amount, you may try to get things into what they call buckets, meaning that you have certain sizes, and you say every file should be one of these sizes, and you basically round up to the nearest one. Um, so here with some of these pages, you know, one concern is that the just among these pages that I showed here, the smallest one and the largest one differ by tens of kilobytes, uh, which is quite a bit. So if we were to just add like 50 bytes, these particular files would not be brought very close to each other. Now, we could say, well, we can have different buckets and we can round to a bucket size. For example, round to the nearest kilobyte or something. And that would create more ambiguity. I've been told that there's some research on this that was not very optimistic about that. I think because of things like link structure and embedding, which is to say, for example, on Wikipedia, um, these files also embed images. And the particular number of images and their size is also a distinguishing factor. So then even if you had these buckets and you said, we're going to round everything to the nearest kilobyte, then there's still the trouble of, oh, well, you loaded this and it was 112 kilobytes. And then you loaded an image that was apparently 33 kilobytes, and then you loaded an image that was apparently 51 kilobytes. Um, so I think the bucket rounding padding solution may not work as well as people first hope. But I would like to see more research that quantifies that. So a thing that makes this especially rough for Wikipedia is that the Wikimedia Foundation publishes a database that you can download of all of the content of the site. And so an attacker doesn't even have to crawl the site. The attacker can just make a replica of the site and then import into a database what all of the article sizes are and then have a database immediately of the article sizes of everything on Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, so I recently saw a presentation by uh, John Kraftick, the, the uh, CEO at Waymo. And one of the questions that he was asked was, classic, you know, how does the AI determine which is the least bad thing to do, kill the pedestrian or kill the occupants of the car? Um, and his response to it was just like, well, we see everything much more than humans, so this will never happen. Mm -hmm. And so your, your um, piece about the morality um, 
determination of A is less than B is less than C is less than A made me think that, if, is, are you seeing any work that goes um, be, sort of between that mathematical place and, and how people in the audience at this presentation were very clear that this didn't make sense and that there was something wrong, but they weren't able, I don't think any of them was thinking about uh, think possibilities. Is, mm -hmm. Are you seeing any work that tries to bridge that to, to help people be able to make more informed arguments to responses like this will never happen, but not necessarily have to go all the way to mathematical proofs? That's a great question, and I don't think I'm aware of something like that. Okay. The thing that you're referring to is often called the trolley problem. Yes. Um, which is a problem in philosophy about a dilemma in which you can allow someone to die or you can change things so that someone else dies instead. And people can try to create variants about this, like you can allow someone to die who is going to die anyway, or change things so that, anyway. Um, and people have thought a lot about that in terms of self-driving cars. I think an interesting point about that is that indeed, the people who are developing self-driving cars don't necessarily expect to encounter these situations very often. Um, and Brad Templeton, who's on our board, has written an essay talking about how he thinks that the trolley problems are not going to be the frequent fundamental thing in self-driving cars that some people envision. Um, but I don't think that that totally removes any consideration of ethics or of assigning different risks you know, because different systems distribute risks in different ways. So if we have an airplane flying over us, there's some risk to the people on the airplane if something goes wrong, and there's some risk to us if something goes wrong. And different kinds of engineering and training mechanisms have allocated those risks differently. And so I do think that's something that the self-driving car people have to contend with to some extent, even if they don't literally anticipate having a trolley problem come up every day. Um, it's a great question about how to sort of talk about that in a meaningful way that's not so mathematical. And I'm not really aware of work on that. Um, on the other side, I know that there's a field called explainable AI that has to do with trying to help people understand how an AI made a decision. But that's sort of in the other direction, right? It's sort of our AI made a decision and now we're trying to help people understand how it made the decision. As opposed to we're trying to understand how to describe the problems that the AI confronts. I was just going to say on the car thing, there's also the side of you can't have a choice of buying a car that is going to put your life first over someone else's car who is going to not put your life first. That's the SUV question right there. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of those things are very interesting if you think about analogies that indeed, like some cars that you can buy actually allocate risks differently more because of their size and speed. Um, and conceivably because of the particular set of safety technologies that are or aren't installed in them. So a lot of those trade-offs do occur. You know, it can be very, very uncomfortable to think about trade-offs in a literal life or death, life or death situation. Um, there was a real famous set of controversies when Ralph Nader got started with the Unsafe at Any Speed book and talking about ways that he felt that the car industry had been very negligent or very careless about their safety engineering. And, you know, some people have responded, if you're making these vehicles, then you know that some people are going to die in crashes and you do have to make certain trade-offs that affect that risk. And it's not necessarily a gravely evil thing to say, well, we're going to improve safety up to a point and not make something infinitely safe. However, it would be great if the society and the customers were able to know more about those trade-offs and those deliberations. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, a strange thing that comes up in making a lot of decisions is thinking about the cost associated with something that you know has some chance of saving lives and that that seems to imply an implicit valuation of life, which is not something that people would like to do. And then people say, it's not necessarily something that you can avoid. Like I'm a cyclist and I bought a bike helmet and I should have replaced my old bike helmet sooner. And it costs $60 to buy a new bike helmet. And I didn't want to pay $60 for a new helmet. But you didn't buy a top of line helmet at $60. <laughs> right, and I could have bought a more expensive helmet. And so all of these things, in terms of people's day-to-day -day choices, seem to imply in a very uncomfortable and disturbing way that people are willing to accept certain risks on behalf of themselves or on behalf of other people and not other risks. And that's not something that's very enjoyable to think about. But in a way, the willingness to think about that has also led to saving lives. That when insurance companies have looked in a very sort of hard-nosed empirical way about the effects of certain behaviors or certain precautions, they've said, you know, this one is worth it. And as a result, they may have saved hundreds of lives or thousands of lives by making those evaluations. Um, but you don't necessarily want to be the person who learns that someone has made this decision about you or on your behalf. Uh, I think we're probably about out of time for this session. So again, if the folks happen to be particularly interested in EFF stuff, we'll have another session here in, I think, just a few minutes. And uh, in any case, thanks a lot for your presence and your attention. <laughs>